गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गना शॉर्ट गना शॉर्ट में आप सबका स्वागत है टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू फोकस ऑन टिबेट विद जनरल विनोद भाटिया फर्स्ट लेट मी वेलकम हिम सो गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गना शॉर्ट एंड वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक ऑफ समथिंग जय हिंद सर एंड वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक ऑफ टिबेट टुडे बिकॉज़ आई थिंक टिबेट आफ्टर लॉन्ग टाइम डिजर्व्स सम अटेंशन एंड अटेंशन एट probably the right level uh what i'd like to tell everyone is recently china came out with the thing that you know they're going to uh, contest the reincarnation of dalai lama and they want to nominate a uh, dalai lama of their choice they are looking at sinicizing tibet you know and so that now tibet the new i mean not tibet uh, buddhism they want buddhism to be done on communist lines when a religion and commun- uh, communism don't mix uh, there there are going to be problems we still know that the central tibetan authority uh, functions from it's a government in exile really functions from dharmsala uh, there is discontent in tibet but at the same time for china also it's a matter of life and death let me put it put that in Uh, in a context first we have to understand uh, that all the waters of china start from tibet whether the two major rivers the yellow river of hangui and yangtze and if that is not there uh, china will be at problems as it is china is facing severe climate change issues there is expanding desertification out there food security is a problem out there electricity is a problem out there they are having droughts when nothing is there. then you know when where they had surplus rain earlier and all this points to availability of water and that water is in tibet plus now we all know that they are tapping water from brahmaputra and diverting it into the yangtze basin so for them it's a matter of life and death and we also know that they have illegally assert tibet and by removing you know illegally asserting tibet uh, or assuming tibet they have removed the traditional civilizational buffer between the chinese civilization and the indian civilization and brought both these great countries together face to face for the first time in the history of this world so that has led to a lot of issues and more i can go on but more than me i would like general bhatia to give us an overview about all this and then we'll discuss issues as they come up and uh, from i mean he he's told me that he's going to speak from his heart today and speak what he wants and then we'll listen to it we not remind let me remind everyone don't you know you must listen to his heart talking today so with this over to you okay well, thank you very much always a pleasure and a learning experience to be on gana short uh, i uh, i actually enjoy the way you conduct it and i enjoy the audience uh, interaction uh, audience bahut acche hain and uh, that is what i you know uh, it's a learning experience so uh, tibet i think is exceedingly important to india tibet is india's neighbor and china is never india's neighbor tibet was our neighbor is our neighbor and we should not forget the history uh, of uh, uh, tibet uh, uh, tibet and china are interlinked and tibet china and india are also interlinked in many ways because as tibet our neighbor and china next tibet and i call it next next tibet so now china uh, wants to become our neighbor or is our neighbor de facto neighbor, right so uh, if you go to the history of tibet which is very interesting actually and i will not go to the you know uh, to the 1821 ad when it started but let me just start from the recent history that is the history of the 20th century and uh, there was you know uh, till 2012 uh, the tibetans were a free land and from 2012 to 1951 uh, sorry 1912 to 2051 you know uh, tibet was an independent state it is only when the chinese came into the annexation of tibet uh, from 1951 onwards uh, that is after 49 when they came in 
and they signed the 17 point agreement uh, which professors to guarantee them with autonomy no it pro professors to guarantee them with autonomy and to respect the buddhist religion but also allows the establishment of chinese civil and military headquarters in assam so the, the trade off was that uh, the 17 point agreement was that the buddhist religion will be accepted tibetan will be given the due autonomy and the chinese civil and military headquarters will be at assam and however the tibetan people consider this treaty as totally invalid and this is described in the tibetan people and the third party commentators say it's a cultural genocide no it's a cultural genocide that means what china wants to do is uh, finish off the culture of uh, tibet and fully integrate it uh, into china you know what china does is basically you know the stages the china strategy and we have to understand the china strategy to defeat china we need to understand china strategy the china strategy is very you know uh, uh, very well defined actually if you if you study china strategy it is clean first they lay claims right then the government occupy after they occupy they legitimize the whole thing the legal warfare as they call legitimization and the next step is exploitation and then integration and this was told to me by a very uh, you know a good intellectual whom i respect a lot general mon city and uh, i must credit, give him credit for this because this is his uh, construct so basically what china does and we have to understand that because that's exactly what it is doing in the in, in eastern ladakh claim occupy legitimize exploit and integrate so these are the stages which uh, china has done and tibet today Uh, is uh, basically into the like you rightly said uh, into you know uh, into the chinese culture sanitization of uh, tibet and tibetans are res are actually resisting it uh, but will they succeed or not uh, that is something which will only time will tell so this is the initial uh, you know uh, the point i would like to make so so i i think you made that very clear in your thing uh lay claim occupy legitimize exploit and integrate which is the typical salami slicing which china does you know slice by slice uh, they'll take and now tibet is at the integration stage right so that's the important for uh, importance for uh, china and like i said water is their prime requirement so they will take and of course china has got an expansionist attitude so they will not let go uh, what i'll do sir is i'll also mention something which we often talk of but we rarely you know uh, focus on and that is this this you know uh, one minute yeah mao's five hand theory or the palm you know where they say tibet is the palm of you know uh, was the palm uh, of a thing a hand and his five fingers were aruna uh, eastern ladakh nepal sikkim bhutan and arunachal pradesh now in this if you see uh, having had tibet now for almost a century they are looking at integrating their fingers also into their whole story right um so this is something which is a long term project which we need to understand if they succeed in any of this we are at risk or territorial integrity and sovereignty is at risk now in between this is the tibet problem i also heard one tibetan say very erudite statement tibet ke azadi mein hi bharat ka suraksha hai in tibet's freedom lies india's you know uh, integrity and uh, sovereignty and safety and security so i would like you to dwell on this why we need to help tibet and how we can go about uh, giving it some kind of autonomy security whatever you feel like how do we do it and we also keep talking of this tibet card and things like that so your your views on all these issues sir. Yeah, th thank you. I think what the Tibetan said is, uh, in a way, very right. Because Tibet is our, you know, uh, with Tibet we got uh, the three C's connected: that is the culture, commerce, and connectivity. Goes back, uh, you know, uh, 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 centuries, a uh, couple of thousand years. Yeah, centuries. So uh, that way, yes. But uh, you know, I would also say uh, Tibet today 
is you know, one, one should look at realities today. And the realities may change tomorrow. I'm not saying it, may, it will not change. But the realities today are that China is uh, integrating Tibet, like you rightly said. And we look, we have in 2003 recognized uh, Tibet as, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, endorsed the one China policy of Tibet in 2003. Right. So that is how, if you look at 2003 or before 2003, we should always call it the Indo Tibetan border. It was always TAR into the Tibetan border. But 2004 onward, we started calling it India China uh, border. And then we had the 2005 ICBR, the India China border roads. Uh, so things started changing after that. Today, uh, all of us, you know, out of usage accepted that it is India China border, which is not so actually. It is into the Tibetan border. The, Tibetan the, border. They're, fought, they're fought in agreements, right? And the most famous 1940 Shimla agreement, actually, which we call the you know, McMahon line and the uh, but it should not be why, why McMahon line. It should be McMahon Shatra line. Where Shatra was a Tibetan uh, uh, representative who signed that. Right. So that is not that. Why McMahon on? McMahon is one, one, one party. The other party is the Tibetan party. So we also go, you know, historically uh, not very correct in many ways, and uh, legally also that's a you know that's a line which Tibet always should should take. Uh, but however, in between, what has happened is. Uh, even uh, his holiness his Dalai Lama uh, has accepted uh, that you know uh, uh, a free Tibet would be uh, you know a difficult proposition, and there's a free Tibet movement among the students. It's been kept alive because the Tibetans are very uh, a great people actually. You know they have integrated so well, assimilated so well into the Indian society. Have you ever heard of Tibetan riots, Tibetan law and order problems, Tibetan you know uh, uh, any anything about Tibet? No. They integrated so very well, and they, they are their business community. They were business sense, uh, sense, and the and they still maintain contact with Tibetans in Tibet. That is a big asset which we need, need to see, and we look we should look at Tibet uh, uh, from the prism of the people of Tibet, their aspirations, the rightful aspirations. Right? And what you also said was that Tibet is sensitive; it is strategic sensitivity of China. And it is not only Tibet, it is the three T's. Tibet, Taiwan, and Turkmenistan. The three T's. Right. So that is China's sensitive, uh, you know, uh, strategic sensitivity. And uh, we should keep that alive. Uh, in 2008, in the, during the you know, Beijing Olympics, uh, when the torch was to pass through Delhi, the Indian uh, ambassador in Beijing was called at 2 o'clock at night and saying, we don't want any Tibetan protests in Delhi. So that is their sensitivity, because some of them they know that what what they've done is uh, morally wrong, and it is our obligation as a responsible nation, and, and that's what we have done. And you know, no other nation has done that, including the Americans. The U.S. has not done it. The government in exile has been in India since 1959. Okay, so that is what we have we have given the support to them. It's not that, and China not liked it. But that's what China is. But we we have a moral obligation uh, to the people of Tibet, and that is how Indo-Tibet relations uh, have grown over the years, and they have assimilated with the Indian culture, with the Indian people, and uh, we respect them. They respect us. Uh, you know, this, this, these are the facts. And what you rightly said is Tibet is important to China. The five, you know, the five fingers: Eastern Ladakh, Parakshai Chin area, uh, Nepal. China expansion is, you know, it, it expands. It, it has taken. If you look at China, uh, and it's a very interesting uh, one, I, I like to take a few minutes on that. You know, China talks of six wars. Okay. It is very easy for us to say, you know, we have a two front war, but China has a six front war. Okay. And I will I will name the six front. This is from a Chinese, uh, uh, it is not a US concern, uh, Western construct. This is from, a, from the Chinese media, right? And the first war is the unification of Taiwan. And it gives timelines. It says 2020 to 2025. We have to 2025 already. Or 2024 end. China considers Taiwan unification non-negotiable. And reserves the right to use war to realize its aims. That is the unification of Taiwan. The second war is the recovery of South China Sea Islands. 2025 to 2030. After a possible victory in Taiwan, it uses the word possible victory. China may shift focus to asserting control of the disputed South China Sea Islands, even though those claims are not tenable under the UN law of the seas. They're not tenable. And uh, the uh, 
International Court of Justice in The Hague has already given a verdict in favor of the Philippines. And the third one, and third one is what we should actually, you know, note very categorically, is a reconquest. It's a reconquest, okay, not conquest. Reconquest of Southern Tibet. That's the word used. And the timeline given is 2035 to 2040. And what is South Tibet? It is Arunachal Pradesh, which it, which China claims 70,000 square kilometers of Arunachal Pradesh, which China, you know, they call it South Tibet actually, and remains a contested area. And that is where uh, I think Chinese aggression and the focal point would be in the uh, in the in the mid to long term after Eastern Pla. And the third is conquering of the islands, uh, which uh, they claim from the Japanese control island, islands. And that is from 2040 to 2045. The islands are currently under Japanese control. The fifth war is the invasion of Mongolia, 2045 to 2050. China views outer Mongolia as part of historical territory and may seek to assert control over it, following similar patterns seen in its territorial dispute elsewhere. That is, claim, which they already done, occupy, legitimize, exploit, and integrate. And the sixth war uh, is very interesting, which is, which is, you know, I thought the China-Russia issues had resolved, the border issue resolved, but no, China not, has resolved it, but it has not forgotten it. And the sixth war is reclaiming land from China, that is in the year 2055 to 2060, China may focus on the regaining land lost to Russia, seeking to up to Siberia, it believes was historically part of China. So this is something, uh, you know, uh, which is uh, very interesting. Construct. It may be right, it may be wrong, but we should factor that in when we talk of China as an aggressor, uh, China's uh, geopolitical ambitions and an integration of China. I think you're right, sir, because uh, as far as the last one is concerned, uh, they already started this, you know, you know, they have this island, Bolshoi Ruskiski, in the uh, river there. And that island uh, in the new map, they've shown it as part of uh, China. Whereas that border was delimited, half the island, the northern part of the island was with Russia, the southern part was with uh, China. Delimited, now they've gone into contest there also. So that's a long term project. Whereas they may have mutual accommodation today because of Ukraine war, but that is coming in the future, there's no doubt. But I would like to come to this business of South Tibet and uh, link it with the you know issue in 2020. And I would like some discussion on this because that concerns us. That like you rightly said, reconquest of South Tibet is the third war. And that they're looking at 3035 and over that. What I'd like to point out, sir, is that we would go into history. There, this, there was never a, a, a term called South Tibet. There's no place called South Tibet in any writings before 2003. There were no, the term South Tibet came into being in 2003 after this MOU was signed between India and uh, China, where we virtually recognized uh, Tibet as part of China and they recognized Sikkim as part of India. Now, if you go into the agreement which was which took place, because I'm going to show put two, three issues and then we'll have to have a discussion on that. If you go into the whole story of what that agreement said, is this. I'll flash it so that we are clear. The, Agreement reads, this is from the MOU from our M, uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, NEA site. The agreement reads, the Indian side agrees to designate Changu of Sikkim state as the venue for border trade market. And the Chinese side agrees to designate Renchingjiang of the Tibet Autonomous Region as the venue for border trade market. You see, two things in this. There's no mention of South Tibet before that. Only after this agreement, South Tibet comes into play. And this was, as per this, it is Tibet Autonomous Region. Today, that that whole thing is not there. No one calls it Tibet Autonomous Region. It, we call it Tibet. They have accepted it, this thing. So this is what the whole story is. And all our agreements with the, on border, peace, tranquility, and all, are based on this 
agreement. This is the fundamental agreement, foundational agreement for India-China talks and whatever you, you, we have. Now, when Tibet, uh, sorry, when China came to Eastern Ladakh, all our agreements have been null and void. As of today, and this is not what I'm saying. This is what our external affairs minister also says, that China has violated all our agreements. If they have violated all our agreements, right, this agreement has also been violated. It tantamounts to that. So isn't it time that we say, okay, thank you, we don't recognize Tibet anymore, because you violated the basic agreement of, and all the this fundamental agreement you already violated. And we don't have to, at least if you don't do it, at least we should put the threat, threat across and put it across to them and say, okay, even your one China principle is at risk. Though we have not actually, we have almost dropped the one China thing in our talks. We, I want your views on this. How do we approach this? Because this will set the tone for how we handle our own border security and our military buildup and all that stuff. It is important to uh, keep putting pressures on China wherever we can. And Tibet, I think, is a pressure point. Let's be very pragmatic about the whole. <clears throat> can we militarily free Tibet? We cannot. Can China militarily capture or reconquest of uh, South uh, Tibet, as they call it, a national protest? They cannot. Well, it is not, it is militarily not, uh, you know, feasible. It is not 1962. India, India is India. India is a resident power. It is a responsible power. It is a military power. It is an economic power. No, it's a, it's a great nation. It is not 1962 anymore. That's why they call it reconquest. Because 1962, they, they, they had come down almost to the uh, foothills time. Right? So when you when you talk of it, is, is it time to you know, uh, give back to China a little of the medicine which they have been giving to us? That's a, that's a key question. So yeah. I, I think... It is time to you know start giving uh, you know uh, uh, doses back to China. You know if I if I was sitting on your uh, uh, show and I would say that uh, do this, I think it's a it's a very fair one. You know uh, uh, you know uh, uh, it's an old thing teeth for teeth. So okay, it can do a patra zamat do it can it's a so we should start giving it back to them, and uh, we are doing it in a, in a very subtle manner. It's not that we are not doing it. We are doing we are standing up to China. And uh, let me say, India has really stood up to China, whether it's particularly diplomatic and military. We have stood up to China. Right? And rightly so. Uh, it is not that China doesn't go back from occupied territories other than Vietnam. They never gone back. And uh, the recent statement of uh, uh, the external affairs minister, Mr. Jai Shankar, 70% resolved, is a factual statement. It's only two places not left to be resolved. And uh, we'll resolve it either politically or diplomatically. We'll see. We, we are firm out there. So the, you are right out there. That it is time now to go on a, you know, uh, selectively to go on a information war offensive. Right. Uh, you know, the cognitive domain is very important. Uh, we should start talking uh, of uh, supporting the cause of Tibet, a free Tibet movement, and the Tibetans are Tibetans. They, they, they have the they have the freedom to do what they want to do. Actually, and uh, if you look at it, it is not only in India. Uh, you know, uh, even the Tibet Resolve Act, which uh, in July, which the, uh, which the U.S. has passed, and it was in Dharamshala. You no, know, why should they pass a, you know an act come to Dharamshala to do it? His Holiness Dalai Lama visiting the uh, U.S. after 48 hours for knee surgery. Why not in in the U.S.? So it's so we are a strong nation. You know, we always consider us a weak nation. We said, okay, you want to do that, do that. Go ahead. But they could have easily done that in US also. They were, that, would, that would send a different signal. So we are doing what we have to do. And uh, un unfortunately, some of us perceive ourselves as soft. I don't perceive us as soft. We are very subtle in our way we do things. We stand from where required. And we are standing from to China. So that is the bottom line. Yeah, I agree with you, sir. Because we've almost dropped the one China. Uh, you know, we don't talk of one China anymore. Uh, we are the only country who has taken proactive action against China, whether it's militarily or diplomatically or anywhere, or even economically. Even now, China is trying to come and you know invest into us, and we are not. We are saying thank you about it. And we are the only country who has really supported Tibet the way it is. 
um, and uh, you know uh, we have stood by Tibet throughout, right? Oh, in this context, uh, don't you think it's can add, time? Can add, yes, we are the only country which has opposed the BRI, which is yes. the channel region. Openly yes, opposed. I the think region. no other country, no other nation openly opposed it. They have either agreed or kept quiet, and rightly so because it passes through our you know CPEC, which is what it means. Passes through our sovereign territory. So we have taken unprecedented steps. In fact, sir, let me put it this way. We banned TikTok overnight. China has, uh, USA has been trying to ban TikTok for the past four years and they have not banned it. That's the difference. Right. Now, having said that, now we have started giving back doses to China, all that we have said. I mean, we have to give it uh, in small doses, big doses. We will give it back. Um, my view is that India and USA have to cooperate much more to on the Tibet uh, factor. Uh, your views on that? Because I think without USA and India, and to a large extent even Europe, uh, the Tibet uh, story will not get resolved or will not get a move forward. Yes, I, you know, the, the, India alone can't uh, you know do very much. We can support them with cause. We are with them. Our heart is with them. Uh, you know, we, we have given them the space which they want. But that is not enough. That's not adequate. The world has to start looking at Tibet the way US looks at Taiwan. Okay. We, 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 you know, they, they, they have to support the, the, the Tibetan cause, actually. The Tibetan people, the aspiration of the people, very, very important. Today, there, there is a growing movement, definitely. You know, the, they're, they're more Tibetan in New York than they were earlier. Uh, but the fact still remains that when they go to the New York, they go more like New York, less like Tibetans. Okay. So I hope that doesn't ha it doesn't happen that way. The Tibetan culture has to be kept alive, and that is what uh, is going to see them through. And US and the Western, uh, you know, European nations, basically, the West, has to support the Tibetan people in their rightful aspirations and in their fight for autonomy uh, as, a, as his, I know the Lama calls. I mean, he's not talking about free Tibet as yet. No, not anymore. But then there's a moment among the students, which is a free Tibet moment. And that needs to be supported. It is not being anti-China. I'm not saying that. It is meeting the aspirations of a people, actually. A people with culture, a people with uh, civilization linkages, and we should respect that. No, we can't, we, we, you know, it is, a, it is a roof of the world. We can't let them go. Uh, they, they're not orphans anymore. We need to support them. And irrespective of the strategic value of Tibet uh, to both China and India, uh, it is more important to support the cause of the people of Tibet. So there's a truism about Tibet when you look into its history, that whenever the Tibet and China, I'll put it this way, Whenever the central power in China was strong, right, Tibet was under China. Whenever the central power in China was weak, Tibet was independent. And any time in between, there were shades of grey. Now, okay, fine. In the last few decades, uh, China was very strong, especially around the Beijing Olympics and all. Beijing Olympics was considered a coming out party for China. And the Tibet movement was completely crushed. But China is weakening. Its demographics are going down. Economy is going down. Its military has problems. And they have internal problems also. And there are a lot of talks of peaking power. Uh, you know, it's a, a economy, a country in decline, uh, all that. So do you see this happening? I mean, I think uh, today it's an period of opportunity we are entering, where the Chinese power will start slowly going down and gives you uh, opportunity for Tibet, whether it's autonomy or go to freedom, one doesn't know. Do you see that happening or do you see that and how do we help that whole process? You know, uh, it's a, uh, it's, this is the critical question, this is the key question. Uh, do I, one, there are two parts to it. One, do I see it happening? And two, uh, how do we help that? How do we go about it? How do we go about it? You know, let, let me take it a little, you know, uh, let, let me take it to the realm of 
imagination. Yeah. If I was uh, on your show three and a half decades ago when two of us were very young and we called Tibet Tibet, and if you were to say, uh, you know, Soviet Union will collapse, will disintegrate, uh, everyone would have laughed on your show. Right or wrong? And yes. I'm talking about no, we couldn't have dreamt. Uh, we couldn't have dreamt it. You know, this, this chap, General Shankar, don't know what's saying. General Vinod Bhatia, the idiot. How can he even think that the Soviet Union, which is the, you know, which is the power, superpower, will collapse? It happened in in a couple of years' time. Right. So I'm not saying that China will collapse tomorrow, but it is not beyond the, you know, uh, if you if you look at things, people have been saying that the. You know, the, this may happen. Yeah, number of papers, it may happen. It is a, it is a communist country with a capitalist ethos. Okay. So there, there there is a yearning for the people for money. Though it's a communist country, the party is all powerful based on the military. Now, how long can the military? And we've seen many 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 jantas, uh, military jantas come and go. You know, uh, even Myanmar today is a very strong military in trouble today, and many, many militaries uh, come and go. So, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that it will happen today. It may happen tomorrow, maybe, maybe one day after tomorrow, or in the, in the near future, it may happen. So, we, the, what I'm trying to imply is that the people of Tibet should keep the struggle alive. They should not get disheartened that nothing is happening, generations are changing. And these are people who have not been to Tibet ever. But don't lose hope and keep the struggle alive. This is my message to the people of Tibet. So what we are saying and is... What could, yes, sir. The second part, what do we do? No, what, what do we do? So we, we keep it alive. This concept of Tibet has to be the... the, the, the you know, it's, it has to keep, and that's what we are doing actually. It's not what do we do in the future. You know, the, the, the Tibet government exile. But like you rightly said, the contestation will happen now. Let's, let's face facts. Uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama said that the next Dalai Lama will not be born in Tibet. In China. In China. In China. And China will impose a Dalai Lama on the people of Tibet. So that is going to be a very sensitive issue. Uh, I, I, I doubt that the Tibetans will accept it. But it will be forced down upon the Tibetans in Tibet. Because the China rules are rules out there. So th this, I think this is something which we'll have to uh, actually wait and watch what happens. I, I firmly uh, feel, and it's my, my, I get the sense that the only option which China has got is to force uh, the, next, uh, the next Dalai Lama on the people of Tibet of their own liking of their own doing, who, who is a puppet uh, to China. And the people of Tibet are not going to accept it. So there are going to be fissures, they're going to be friction, they're going to be fault lines. And now what do we do about that uh, is something uh, which I think uh, uh, we can think about. You know, people are very important. And, uh, yeah. You know, on your, on, on your show only, on your, on your uh, channel only, was I said, that if you look at the 2020 face off with in Eastern Ladakh, the advantage we had was the people of Eastern Ladakh. They supported us. No, that yes. sort of a resource not available with the with the PLA. Okay, it's the people of uh, people of Eastern Ladakh, the people of Dutch, the people of Sikkim, it's the people of the uh, of Uttarakhand, it's the people of Himachal Pradesh in the in the sugar sector who support us. Without that, I think we'll be nowhere. So what China is now doing is building a great wall of villages. Right. But they're putting people who are not sons of the soil. So how will they adapt? What will they do out there? So that has to be seen. So our support has to be for the people and people of people centric approach is a very good approach. So I think you actually opened up a very, very, very interesting thing. I'll connect the border issue up with the Dalai Lama's reincarnation. Uh, and I'll, we'll give a scenario and we'll see how to handle it. Uh, you see, the crux of either territorial conquest or defending an area 
like you rightly said, are the people. People will always remain the center of gravity of any nation. Now, having said that, we have just discussed that China will impose a Dalai Lama on Tibet of their choice and then manipulate. Equally, the Dalai Lama and the Central Tibetan Authority, who is here, will also nominate a Dalai Lama. We can see it happen because it happened in the Panchal Lama case. And that Dalai Lama who has been nominated might not be in China. He might be anywhere else outside the Chinese thing. So we're going to have two Dalai Lamas. And that might generate some friction within Tibetan society in Tibet. And Tibetans don't live only in uh, Tibet. They are also in Gansu. They are also in Yunnan. They are also in Sichuan. So that, so there will be some rumblings with them. So that is the, the cultural part and the instability part, which will come into Tibet whether we like it or not. It will happen. Now, I read a rank study, sir. This was about five, six years back. Now, which, which it was a Belfast Center. No, it was not Rand. It was a Harvard uh, study. Belfast Center ka study hai, which uh, examined the strategic postures of India and China. Now, as per this, the troop densities and the troop uh, in Tibet and across, along the LAC, both are almost at par between China and India, give or take a few thousand. That's their assessment. And they feel that despite this, China will be at a disadvantage because they have to commit a whole lot of people for the internal security of Tibet and their internal lines of communication. And this was before five years back, this assessment. Uh, now, at that time, the issue of uh, uh, 2020 Ladakh intrusions had not taken place. Uh, if you go into the future, the, the issue of reincarnation of uh, Dalai Lama, the nomination of the Dalai Lama and the instability which will come about will not was not envisaged. It was not envisaged that China will go down. So as things are moving with the infrastructure going and all that, do you see that we have a time ahead where we need to be more proactive? Is there a window of opportunity opening up for India, militarily, diplomatically, and more? This uh, you know, this question of opportunity. Opportunity is there, definitely. But we need to speed up our own infrastructure first. In our case, let's say facts. We got terrain fractured sectors. Each of sector terrain fractured. The, the complementarity uh, between Eastern Ladakh, even within Eastern Ladakh, uh, is not there. Not there. If you look at you know Eastern Ladakh and uh, the Himachal sector, it is not there. The Himachal sector, Uttarakhand sector, is not there. Uttarakhand sector to Sikkim is a vast, vast difference. Sikkim to Arunachal is a, you know there is Bhutan in between. Completely. Uh, those valleys. So we we all been through that. So we have terrain fracture sector, and for that we need an infrastructure push first. Uh, we uh, have to ensure uh, uh, an equitable, proportional, timely deployment in case of uh, China upping the ante. Right? We are not yet. We are not constructed the third uh, road to Ladakh. Uh, once that comes up, more have to come up. More bridges are required from Putra. So we need to catch up first. We are doing it at a great speed, but there is a limitation to that. And once we have that, we also have to understand that it is not China's infrastructure, which is multimodal, which is multidimensional, state of the art, has got certain weaknesses. It has got a very long line, you know, from, from the mainland to uh, uh, the Western Theatre Command and Western Theatre Command to uh, the in India Tibet border. Is a very long line, it's about 2500 kilometers. That takes time, and though it's a plateau, but that plateau is a harsh plateau to the world. So, we'll have to match that. But to match that, first we need infrastructure, and we need certain, you know, uh, like I keep saying, 
uh, we have to purchase ease through preparedness. I, I repeat the purchase peace through preparedness. So we'll have to invest more in defense. We are we looking at you know, we're looking at China, we're looking at Pakistan also, we're looking at Bangladesh now. So we we have we have certain issues. So we cannot only look at China, we'll have to also look internally. Right. So we'll have to invest into the infrastructure, we'll have to invest in the armed forces and then uh, look for the opportunity to exploit. Yeah, so the opportunity is there. How we have to exploit it is something, and this opportunity is coming ahead. I mean, this opportunity is coming ahead because of climate change. It is coming up because of weakening China. It is coming up because of the cultural change which is going to happen in Tibet. And the fact that as time goes, India will become stronger. You can't, you know, you have to. So these are there. And I, I mean, this is my view, sir, in the next one decade, maybe when we talk of this, even five years ahead, we are going to see a change, a great change. In fact, my assessment, my personal assessment is that in five years, China will have to completely internalize because their uh, demographic issues will show up in a big way. Already with nothing showing up, with just the tip of the iceberg of the demographic collapse, which is happening in China, they are worried. In five years now, I think they will be completely internalized. And in the next five, in within this decade, uh, they will be in a different shape altogether. My view is this window of opportunity has will be there. Uh, so we got to expect that. We uh -huh. need to be ready to expect that. Right. And for that, we need investments. More and more. More and more. I mean, uh, so, I mean, let me ask you, uh, you know, sound you off. Do you think my analysis is okay that this window of opportunity will present itself within half a decade to a decade? Or am I being too optimistic? No, it, it, is, it is, I suppose, uh, it is an optimistic balanced view. You know, there are fissures, there are frictions in China. And that opportunity, like I rightly said, you know, in the late 80s, no one could have, no could have no one could have imagined the collapse of Soviet Union. Right? So what you say today, uh, it's very difficult. You know, uh, internal, you know, China is a closed society. That's what you call the, you know, uh, what happens within China is not really known outside. Very few things come out. What comes out is very limited, actually. You know, China is a closed society. They, they don't access like we have. We not we are open. Uh, even social media access is denied and they have certain rules and policing in this communist country. We all know that. So what, what exactly, how much is the, uh, uh, is, the, is, the is the fault lines, uh, how, how deep are the fault lines, fault lines definitely they are, how deep they are, we'll have to keep a watch on it. Unfortunately, I think we, uh, our, our things come from the, you know, Western media basically, Western papers. Uh, we have to understand China from an Indian perspective. Right? And when you look at China, like I said, six wars, and I repeat that, we always talk of you know, two and a half front wars for India. But we should also look at China you know, as vulnerable in many fronts, multiple fronts. So what you say is opportunity. So we have the opportunity. I, mean, I will not say it's a military opportunity, but as a nation, we have opportunity. And that we should be ready to exploit. And I come back to the, you know, what we discussed in the 4D strategy uh, on your uh, channel. Yeah, we did with that. Too. Right. And that, that holds good. The 4D strategy is an excellent strategy. Defend the LAC, dominate the lines of communication, uh, the line, the sea lines of communication, the sea lines of this thing, the choke point especially. And deaf diplomacy, bind to balance with the you know nations which have Congress of interest and deny space in the, in the South Asia region. So that we'll have to keep doing. And once we keep doing that and the opportunity comes, exploit it. Yeah. So the 4D strategy is important. I'd like to tell all our viewers that General Bhatia and I have done a video on the 4D strategy which we have to adopt against China. So I would request you all to go through that because that is has got great depth in the way we have to do things. Uh, so uh, thank you. I thought we had a terrific discussion today. The main thing which 
we i take home at least i take home is uh, is the fact that there is a opportunity coming ahead in china and this opportunity and the window of opportunity for india is opening up say from 5 to 10 years from now i i will not force look beyond it 10 will, years but at least it will be more also it could be before yeah, i agree with you it could be before uh, the way things are happening in china instead of it would be a door also it could be a door also is Means india door. ready to is india ready to kick the door open or exploit the window of opportunity is a big question mark and what we have to do to do uh, you know exploit this uh, is something which is the biggest takeaway for me today from this show and the the side by side you know this is india's way of looking at things side by side i think the second thing which you have put across is how does india help tibet in and the people of tibet to realize their aspirations so that i think is a very important thing which you, we discussed in the first thing so these two takeaways sir with your uh, Uh, unless you have some any other takeaway from today's discussion no uh, thank you i think that this is all and uh, right i'll, I'll the... take a few questions if you uh, uh, i'll take a few questions sir uh, some questions are repetitive of what we've said but i think it's worth repeat, uh, repeating it so thanks a lot we've had a great thing your final comment and then we'll close the shows no thank you very much i, I think i've enjoyed the uh, the last one hour plus of uh, Uh, the conversation we had and i actually enjoyed the interaction interactive session Ex- excellent uh, you know you you are very good and uh, thank you very much and let's let, you know let's not lose hope we are a strong nation we are a nation which is doing exceedingly well and we will consolidate and keep doing well let's not look at china from you know keep hope kar de kaise kar dega bhai batao jane ki problem bahut hai they want more problem than us much more problem than us we have some problem definitely so let us believe in ourselves and let us be very proud of being indians thank you very much and jai hind thanks a lot sir uh, to all the viewers i'd like to say tomorrow we'll have a open house and on any subject you want but i'm going to give a update on what's happening in bangladesh and we'll also cover a bit of sri lanka and maldives in this update uh, because where doors are opening some doors are trying to get shut but we'll open all of them that's the confidence i have but we'll discuss that tomorrow till then thank you sir good evening to you and jai hind sir and jai hind yeah, to all viewers thank you and jai to all your viewers thank you very much jai hind and khush ho